uh, the meeting of the Bristol Virginia City Council for today, January 9th, 2024. And we'll start the meeting with a moment of silent prayer. And now, if you'll join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. We'd like to welcome everyone out tonight. Thank you for coming to the meeting. Um, we've got quite a few here tonight. And we'll, we'll start out with the Mayor's Minute and Council comments. Um, okay. nope. Well, I'll just start and say uh, today is the National Gratitude for Law Enforcement Day. And so I know we've got at least one officer here. So I would just like to extend our sincere thanks and appreciation for your for the courageous men and women who dedicate their lives to ensuring our safety. Your unwavering commitment and sacrifices do not go unnoticed, and we are grateful for your tireless efforts to you make to have make our community secure. Thank you for your selfless honor and dedication. Uh, which contribute to making our homes and neighborhoods better places. Your bravery does not go unnoticed. And today we honor and express our deep gratitude for the incredible work you do. Thank you. All right. Uh, next we'll have city manager comments. Yes, council, just a few comments. Uh, city offices will be closed on Monday, January 15th for Martin Luther King Day. In-person early voting uh, for Bristol, Virginia City voters will be available at City Hall beginning on Friday, January 19th and ending on Saturday, March 2nd for the March 5th, 2024 presidential primary, so go vote. Uh, the Department of Community Development is still asking for input on the comprehensive plan. Please go to bristolforward.com and fill out the survey. And applications are open from January 8th through February 13th for the Believe in Bristol 2024 Entrepreneur Grants Program. There's training and $50,000 in grant money to be awarded to the winners. All right, thank you. Um, next, we'll have adoption of the agenda. Uh, I move for the adoption of the agenda as presented. Second. All right, we have a motion by Councilman Osborne and a second by Councilman Farnham. Uh, clerk, please call the roll. Farnham? Yes. Holmes? He was there, just very quiet. Okay. Osborne? Yes. Pollard? Yes. Nate? Yes. And I will say, uh, for the record, we, uh, Jake Holmes, Vice Mayor Jake Holmes is calling in tonight. Um, he is on a work assignment and will be, he's uh, joining us via Zoom. Okay, uh, regular agenda. First, we have Piedmont Avenue and Cumberland Street intersection traffic signal, uh, staff report. Good evening, Council. Um, so tonight I'd just like to discuss the traffic signal at uh, Piedmont Avenue and Cumberland Street as it relates to a couple topics. One is the downtown parking plan and the MUTCD. The MUTCD is the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices and it's published by the Federal Highway Association. And basically it's a guideline for all the states and communities to try and coordinate all the standard signs and warrant analysis across the nation. So um, you may have noticed a few months ago when we repaved Good Street and Piedmont Avenue, we took advantage of that time to restrip those streets to add additional downtown parking. Mm -hmm. And as part of that plan, we'd planned on having the traffic signal removed at Piedmont and Cumberland. Basically, a four-way stop intersection is going to be safer for the pedestrians and for anyone that's trying to use the diagonal parking that we put in. So just real quick, I wanted to run through the warrant analysis. There's multiple ways you can look at an intersection to see if a signal is warranted or not. 
I'm going to skip all the verbiage and just go to the results. But basically, with the uh, warrant one, you've got three conditions you can look at. You can look at condition A, B, and condition A, B, and those are defined on the previous slide. But we can delve into that more if you want to. But basically, you've got to have eight hours uh, based on traffic volume, whether or not a signal is warranted. And in all cases, the signal wasn't warranted. And before the council meeting started, I handed you a different slide. Warrant 1A, 1B, I had a copy-paste error. There were four yeses, and it should have been four noes. But it doesn't matter because the signal's not warranted with that condition at all. And if you go and look at uh, warrant 2, it's a four-hour vehicle warrant. And if you go through all the data and plot it on the graph, you can see all the data doesn't even, uh, it's not plotted above any of those lines, which means the signal's not warranted for the four hour period. Mm -hmm. If you go to signal three, which is a peak hour, you also plot that on a graph, and there is only one point that even plotted on the graph based on traffic volumes. And so that doesn't meet, any, doesn't meet the warrant for uh, warrant three. Warrant four is a pedestrian volume. And uh, basically, based on the intersections within the city, it's unlikely that any intersection would meet warrant four based on uh, pedestrian volumes. Mm -hmm. Warrant five is talking about school crossings. This intersection is nowhere near a school crossing intersection, so it doesn't meet this warrant. Warrant six is when you've got multiple signals that are coordinated together. The signal here is not coordinated with any of the adjacent intersections. Warrant seven is a crash analysis. There was only one accident in 2019 and it was a rear end condition, which doesn't even apply to this warrant. But if you go through the data, it doesn't meet any of the warrants for this warrant uh, for the warrant analysis. Uh, roadway network. This is based on uh, looking at your long range plan and whether or not any future predictions uh, satisfy this warrant condition. And warrant eight's not satisfied either. And warrant nine is when you're talking about your intersection with a grade crossing. And there's mm -hmm. not a grade crossing at this intersection. So warrant nine is not applicable either. In uh, 2021, additional traffic counts were done for this intersection. And depending on the direction of flow, you can see there's a reduction in volume anywhere between 7 and 34%. So we're not even back to uh, pre-COVID conditions at this point. So the signal is not warranted. It doesn't make sense to keep it if you're looking at it from a safety perspective for pedestrians mm -hmm. and the diagonal parking. So, here for any questions you may have. Any questions? Uh, I, I do have one. Thank you for the presentation, first off. Um, it, it might not be a question, but it's just kind of a general concern. I know we had, I know we had discussed this um, a few years ago, probably in 2019 or 2020. Um, and yeah, obviously there were, we, we ended up not doing, you know, there were some concerns. Um, some of the local business owners around had expressed some some concerns. I, I, my understanding is that's not the case this time, right? That's my understanding as well. Um, my, my main worry, I know the numbers don't really reflect a lot of accidents or, or anything like that. Coming coming down Cumberland Street, you know, from you cross Commonwealth coming down Cumberland Street, that's a pretty significant hill you're coming down. And... Um, I, I worry if it's just a stop sign, you know, for, for pedestrian safety and, and, you know, people making a, an unprotected left turn there. Um, would it be possible if we ended up doing this to uh, maybe like on the way down Cumberland Street have rumble strips or, or something to, because I, I know we'll have appropriate signage ahead of time to warn people that we're going to do this, but maybe as a permanent fixture to, to physically say, hey, slow down. Well, even with, if you go to modify an intersection, there is a period of time that you've got to put out more visible signs and 
you could even flash the signal red in all four directions. So there is a period of time that we could definitely post it to warn people that there's a different traffic condition at this point. Um, and, you know, rumble strips is an idea. It's something we could definitely talk in house and see if we could put that in. But uh, I forget, Jay. Do you remember how long you got to post an intersection we changed? I don't remember. Yeah, additional pavement markings and stuff. Yeah, we can definitely look at that. I know it's a significant amount of time for you know the the temporary notice that it's yeah. that it's changing, but but I think something more permanent might hopefully deter against people just running through the stop sign. Uh, there's nothing to stop them from running the red light, obviously, but you know, deter them from running the stop sign and causing trouble coming down that hill pretty fast. Yeah, we can come up with some options and post it, make it more visible, pavement markings or maybe additional signage or something like that. We can definitely do that. Thank you. Well, no, uh, no real questions or anything for me, but thank you for the presentation. And, and I do remember when we brought this up last time, I do think it was 2019. It was right before COVID, I think. And maybe at the time there wasn't a consensus to, to make any change. But I, I do remember in our conversations back then, it, there was some discussion about how with a stop sign, everyone's slowing down in every direction every time. And with the stop light, sometimes people are actually speeding up, speeding up to go th get through the yellow and um, you know, at least in a conversation I had with Mr. Perkins from, from Blackbird Bakery, it, it seemed like it was a discussion and then they were supportive of a stop sign. I think he had mentioned to me, uh, from what I recall, how they have also seen people speeding up to get through the yellow light sometimes. And, and they do have a lot of pedestrians coming in and out of their business right there on the corner. So I guess it, it would be a change. Um, but if, if you were looking for many guidance or suggestions from us i i would i would think it'd be appropriate especially with the data that you showed tonight as well okay um i would have would have one con potential concern and that is that we really don't know what changes may be uh necessary in that area over the next few years as we have dramatically uh increased numbers of guests in our area uh, obviously, we have some big developments that are in the works. Uh, and is that going to increase traffic there? We don't really know. And we won't know for another couple of years. Um, and I would be concerned that we do something too hastily just to have to reverse it later on at our exp own expense. Um, but on the other hand, I like... Uh, <coughs> as most people who have been involved with the city for any period of time might know, I like improvements that help for pedestrian travel and the improvements that you've drafted include adding crosswalks in all directions. Yes. And I very much like that. If, uh, this if we do continue with a traffic signal there, uh, I would still like to have the pedestrian improvements. And of course we won't know for the next couple of years how that works out my initial thought would be that maybe we should wait a couple of years if we put in tra uh, stop signs in the meantime that for improved safety i wouldn't want to uh, be too quick to remove signals just have to put them back in later at our expense well even if we uh, kept the crosswalks and the signal I'd want pedestrian heads there, which we, we'd have to improve the intersection at that point, um, which may necessitate taking the signal out. The cabinet's old anyway. It would, my recommendation would be to go ahead and change it to a four-way stop, and then in the future, if we need to do another analysis and see if the signal's warranted, we could, and then we could upgrade the cabinet, put a new cabinet in, put new heads in, put head, uh, pedestrian heads, push buttons. So we're probably looking at um, needing to replace the entire signal arrangement shortly anyway. Yeah, we've got some older uh, traffic cabinets in the city, and this is one of them. And we probably need to go ahead and look at, take it down anyway, just from that perspective. Would that potentially include uh, adding the beams rather than cable suspended? The mask arms, that's yeah. something we'd have to figure out because you got the 
bridge it runs down through there as well. So I don't know if there'd be room for the mast arms at this point without mm -hmm. doing a lot of improvements to the intersection sidewalk. There may be some right of way we need. I mean, there's a lot of factors going into mast arms. Okay. So we have a lot of details to consider with this. If, if and you, this is just the start of a much bigger discussion. Though. Yeah, if you fully upgrade the intersection. Just a quick side note, since the slide is up there now, it's not really about this topic, but I've heard a lot of positive feedback from a lot of people about the change in parking, the additional parking on the street there. So thank you all for your work on yeah, that. So. Um, yeah, the parking's great. Uh, do you, one, one other question I had that just kind of popped into my head when, when this came up here. Do you foresee any kind of issues with, um, I, don't, I don't, I was trying to think, I don't think there is, with limited line of sight where basically the, the lane shifts a little bit if it you're does on Cumberland. shift, and we, we've driven that section, and you may notice we took out some parking spaces that we originally put in because there's some sight distance issues. So we did, uh, we took out maybe four or five spots, something like that. But, uh, you know, four-way stops going to make you stop. Well, you're supposed to stop at the intersection, and then you can really focus on where you need to be as you're driving. That's assuming people actually obey the rules of the, the road. Is that indicating replacing the uh, turning lane with the median? So we've striped that. If you go out there today, the section in pink, I guess, is what you're talking about. That is striped right now, and the future plans is to uh, build a concrete, basically increase the width of the uh, sidewalk to keep people, to move them in the direction we need them to move. We just hadn't got to that. So then basically it sounds like your recommendation at this point anyway may be to replace the signal with stop signs. And if we need to put a replacement signal back in a few years, we'd probably need a new signal by that point anyway. You probably need to do a new analysis anyway to see if it triggers any of the warrants. And then if it does, you probably need to fully upgrade that intersection so you've got pet head. Because of the age, you would probably need to do that. And anyway. the age, the cabinet's old, and the signal head's old. Thank, Thank you, you for much. the presentation. I just have a few comments. I did um, talk to a few of the business owners around this, just to get their feedback from it. So I talked to Randall Perkins from Blackbird Bakery, and he is very much in favor of the four-way stop. He um, was telling me that um, as late as just a a month or so ago, his building was even hit. And so he's had his building hit several times um, from what I understand. And he says a lot of it is people will come down that hill, it's on caution or you know, getting ready to turn red and they're flying to get through it. And that's the result of some of the accidents. And so he feels like by going to the four-way stop, um, everyone knows you've got to stop regardless. Instead of trying to race or speed up to get through it, you know you've got to stop, so they're gonna be planning to stop. And he feels like that it would um, help to decrease accidents. I also spoke with Faith Esposito, who has a law firm right near there, too. And um, she said kind of the same thing, that she felt, um, felt fine with doing the four-way stop. And um, she didn't think that um, it would hurt by doing that. Um, if anything, it would help in, again, decreasing accidents at that corner or at that four-way stop because you have to, you know that you've got to stop. Um, so thank you for the presentation and the detail, uh, the details and the data with it. Um, but I also was thinking about if we end up doing the four-way stop for a time period, you know, having those, those lights still up there just on, on, on red, flash. you know, flash. flashing red, you know, so, uh, for, for whatever amount of time. Yeah, we definitely do that just to call people's attention to them. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Next item on the agenda is approval of tax exempt real estate application staff report. Uh, Council um, Commissioner Revenue Chloe Eva Barker is here tonight. Uh, she has an application that would be for use for nonprofit organizations who are seeking an exemption from taxes on property used for religious, charitable, patriotic historical, benevolent, cultural, or public park and playground purposes only. Uh, this data would be provided by the organization to the um, Commissioner of Revenue in order to make a determination 
as to whether or not the property meets uh, tax exemption requirements. Um, I'll let Ms. Barker speak a little bit on the process that she would use for that so that uh, council will know how it would work going forward. Hello, I'm Chloe Eva Barker, Commissioner of the Revenue. <clears throat> this application was derived from several throughout the state. Um, we had, um, we really didn't have an application here. Um, we just took their information and then it was presented to council. So we thought that this would be streamlining a little bit better, getting a little bit more information of what these organizations want to do. Um, some of the, so they have to pro provide us with evidence of what their purpose is for this. Um, it's um, two or three pages long. It's a little bit, it's a little bit lengthy, but um, <clears throat> it seemed to cover pretty much everything. Um, my question is, when do you want to cut off a deadline for this each year? And how often do you want this presented to city council? Once a year, twice a year, or as I receive the applications? So could you give us a little background on how you've done this in the past? So it, is it been... Um, as I've done it in the past... On basis? Yeah. As the people, as the organizations, churches, whatever, has presented me with their 501c information and also a letter as to their intention to the building or the property, what they're going to use it for, it has come before city council and you all have voted to um, accept it or and to make it retroactive or to determine a date when it would be um, in, in effect. What would your recommendation be on a time frame in order not to have to be retroactive and to, mm -hmm. to move forward? Well, right now, I have about three applications I've been holding for a little while. Okay. Uh, one's from a church, one's from a uh, another organization um, that has already been tax exempt in the city before prior to this. Um, I would... I, there, we really don't have that many during the year. I would think once a year would be fine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we've said in here, and it's in my instructions that, you know, we tell the people they need to pay their taxes up until the time that it is determined mm -hmm. that you have been exempted <coughs> from taxes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, something doesn't fall delinquent. And have you found, you mentioned other areas doing this. Is this what most um, cities and uh, counties do that you've found? Yes, most of them. Uh, I took this from some of the larger cities, I think it was Lynchburg and um, two or three different places. And I just sort of took a little bit from each application and kind of fit it into what we had here, what we needed, what questions we needed to ask. And then this would still, each time, the, the council would still have approval. This is yeah, not this, be, yes, yes. Okay. I, I just gather the information and give them to give me everything, and then it would be presented to you all for final approval. Okay. So I know you've only got three, and thank you for being here. I know you've only got three right now, um, but then in the past when we've done this, sometimes it's been retroactive. We've had to go back and, and do refund. What, would it, well, well, not so much refund. I just have I just have to uh, yeah. abate that off the books. Like would it now. would it make more sense if we did it? Well, I guess it's for. Would it make more sense if we did it every six months, to to have less that's of fine. a backup, and then you wouldn't have to go back and try and fix stuff later? Well, that's fine. Maybe. I mean, because I, I I don't want us to to micromanage all of this because you know it's it's certainly your job and it's your office's job and I mean you don't want us stepping on your toes doing all this but but if it's every six months maybe that would keep you from having more stuff to fix later on yeah well you know in the past this was all done by the state all this paperwork you know was given to the state and they made the exemption then it got pushed back onto the localities so uh, six months is fine with me I mean do you want to do it January and June I mean or, or whatever or what months would it be reasonable if the deadline were um, 
say two two weeks in advance, or would it be better if it was a month in advance, or what kind of time frame would work well with your office? The um, uh, tax is effective January one and July one, correct? Uh, or yeah. January one, actually. Yes. It's yes. Just uh -huh. Then paid second. Are we talking about the second, like the first and second half billings for the real estate? Mm -hmm. You know, we, do we want to do it before June fifth and before December fifth? Before the two billings, is that what you're saying? But the <laughs> tax is actually as uh, for whoever owns the property as of July, uh, January one, isn't it? Yes. Yes. In which case, is it worthwhile to do it? Uh, based on the billing dates or based on the uh, ownership dates? Because the, the, the uh, December billing is basically based on whoever owned it the previous January, isn't it? Yeah, for yes. The, for the previous six months. Which means it sounds like it may be uh, reasonable to then have a deadline of middle of, of December after the the December payments are done. So there, people are no longer having to worry about those as far as in the offices trying to process things. Mm -hmm. And um, since it's based on ownership as of January 1, if someone has transferred the property earlier during the year, they then apply for exemption as of that January 1 just okay. as, as they would with the tax payments. Okay. That, that's just my thoughts anyway. Uh, so this is your profession. So <laughs> let us know if that sounds reasonable. Yeah, I think the twi twice a year is fine and we can do it. Um, we can do it like that. That's what that'll work. Now, whatever, whatever you recommend, uh, I'm just trying to basically <laughs> nail down details. <clears throat> okay. Well, you know, any property that's owned January 1st, you know, if there's any transactions, anything sold during the year, you know, we're going to, we're going to take care of that sale a month later. You know, we're basically a month behind in doing the transfers because we have to wait till the end of the month to get them. And then it takes us till, uh, you know, a couple of weeks into the next month to get them done. So um, <clears throat> then by the time the person gets me the letter and the documentation and things like that, um, if we had it due, um, say, January 15th and July 15th, I mean. So then the property is owned as of January 1, mm -hmm. but really you don't need to deal with the billing issues until the mid-year billing. So yeah. you've got plenty of time to Yeah, process. yeah, so the billing, yeah, the billing's not till uh, in okay. April. Which yeah. gives a lot more flexibility, a lot less stress over the, the whole issue. Yeah. And reality, in reality, there's not a ton of applications we're talking about. No. You know? So realistically, what are we looking at? An average a year? Four or five at the most, yeah. probably. I mean, I mean, really, three to five. And so with that, I'm just thinking, do we just do it on an ongoing basis as you need them? Would that make more sense? Or would you rather collect them and bring them all at one time twice a year? It, it doesn't matter to me. I mean, it, it's either way. I don't know. I mean, I don't want to clog up the, the agenda. Yeah. But, no. uh, you know, like I said, you know, usually there's, you know, a couple at a time or something like that. But it's. Um, Maybe we accumulate them to one meeting a month. That way we're still. You have a chance to gather a couple at a time, potentially. And it's going to take them a little while to get this application filled out and, you know, get back. Council, if I could offer a suggestion, I, I think it would probably be best to do it as she gets them because lots of times some of the issues I hear from taxpayers is that hasn't been approved yet. And mm -hmm. so I think the quicker we could approve them, uh, the more at ease the taxpayer would be. Mm -hmm. So just from what I see on my side of things, I think it may be easier just to <coughs> approve it as we get it. 
So forget about the deadlines and the coordination. It's extra overhead that we don't really need. Yeah, I mean, because, yeah. you know, as you said, maybe five a year at the most. And I, mm -hmm. I, I can probably, I don't even know if I can think of five in the seven years that I've been here. So, um, you know, I think we could easily handle, you know, one or two applications per council meeting if we had to. Should we, now there's a, another issue that comes up along with this, and that is basically um, giving exemptions for, for previous periods. Would it be reasonable to establish as a policy that the exemption only goes back to January 1 uh, before the application is filed? I think that's up to you all as to how you want to handle that. <coughs> that handle way that. we don't we don't have issues where someone comes up and say, oh, we've had this property for three years, but we didn't realize we could apply for exemption on it. And then they have, they need to reasonably demonstrate that it's been in use for an appropriate tax exempt purpose for that entire time. Mm -hmm. And then you have to go back and credit the previous period as well. Seems like it'd mm -hmm. be reasonable if it was, if the exemption only goes to January 1, of the current year does that sound reasonable to you well i mean that's that's a decision you all would have to make if you wanted to make it effective january 1 of each year well no earlier than january 1 because it doesn't go before they actually yeah. purchase the property mm -hmm. and use it for an exempt purpose I will tell you that I have one right now that uh, the property was purchased in October of 22 and um, the taxes were paid through 22, but they have not paid anything for 23. And I've been holding that, trying to get this application and all of that approved so I could present it. So there is going to be taxes for 23 on that particular piece of property. If they filed the paperwork with you mm -hmm. last calendar year, then if the exemption goes to January 1 of the year that it was filed, then if there happens to be a delay for whatever reason, mm -hmm. getting it approved with us, that's a different matter. We don't want to penalize the applicant. Yeah. Well, I told her we were in the process of getting an application together, and, you know, that was pending, so, I mean... So does it seem reasonable then to the council that the uh, applicants um, get a, an exemption no earlier than January 1 of, of the year in which it's filed? Council, if I may, uh, whether or not you want my opinion or not, um, I think it would be in everyone's best interest to say that it's, uh, it's exempt from the time that it's approved. So mm -hmm. if someone, uh, uh, gets their approval if they put in their application January 9th it comes to us on the first meeting in February it's exempt from that time forward because once you start trying to go back and take care of taxes I mean like this one instance you know that's a year's worth of taxes that should have been paid that haven't been paid and I think from the time that the application is approved is when the taxes are exempt rather than when they submit the application rather than when they submit the application because if, if we're approving them as they come then we should be able i mean as soon as miss barker gets the application she can forward that to us to get it on the next agenda you know whenever that next agenda would be i, I would say i would say going forward that'd be good i think in, i think in that specific case obviously we would want to do the right thing and go back and mm -hmm. you know do it from 23 but i think going forward that would be fine just exempt from the time that we approve it onward okay. and just do it on a, on a case by case. So that way, hopefully we can approve them as quickly as we can. Yeah. Okay. And I know you, I know you said we only have a few, so it's not like we're going to be doing 20 every meeting. So. Oh, no, no, no. I can only remember a handful since I've been on council, less than a handful. And if, so. we're, doing, if we're doing 20 every meeting, we have a bigger <laughs> tax problem. Than, yeah, yeah. Than we're approving. giving away yeah. too much. Yeah. That's right. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you. All right, we're looking for a motion um, uh, and a second. I move to approve the uh, tax exempt real estate application as presented. Second. 
All right, we have a motion from Councilman Osborne and a second from Councilman Pollard. Mm -hmm. Council discussion. I think we've had our discussion. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, clerk, please call the roll. Barnum? Yes. Holmes? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Pollard? Yes. Nay? Yes. All right. Um, supplemental appropriation of $796,714 staff report. Thank you, Mayor and members of Council. This item is a supplemental appropriation of $796,714 consisting of items in the general fund, beginning with the city attorney, appropriate additional funds for ongoing legal fees, $745,000, the police department, appropriate reimbursements received for overtime paid to officers working security at Bristol Virginia Public Schools events, $2,590. Also in the police department, appropriate donations received, $15,000. City Sheriff, appropriate donations received, $10,000. The Street and Engineering Divisions, appropriate insurance proceeds received for property repairs, $15,554. And then in the Solid Waste Disposal Fund, appropriate insurance proceeds received for equipment repairs, $8,570. Again, making the total supplemental appropriation $796,714 and staff recommends that council approve the supplemental appropriation as listed. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, we are looking for a motion. Um, I, uh, I move to approve the supplemental appropriation in the amount of $796,714. All right. Second. All right, we have a motion from Councilman Osborne and a second from Councilman Farnham. Council discussion. And so just for the record, I know you said it, but just so we're, we're all abundantly clear, the 745 is for outside attorney fees related yes, to that's correct. stuff we look at. Yes. I like that we are, uh, the city is receiving some recognition by our local organizations and uh, charitable individuals in uh, giving to some of, of our local emergency services. <laughs> uh, and we, we do appreciate the recognition to those who are working hard to keep us safe. All right, with no further discussion, clerk, please call the roll. Farnham? Yes. Holmes? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Pollard? Yes. Nay? Yes. Okay, next we have ordinances, first reading. First ordinance reading for file number 03-2023, <coughs> request for a zoning map amendment to 1875 Long Crescent Drive. Um, we don't have anyone signed up for public comments and we'll go to the staff report from Jay. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, members of council. I'm just gonna kind of go to the, the zoning map view of the <coughs> presentation just leave it there unless you need me to move it along um, staff has received a zoning map amendment or rezoning for property located at 1875 along Crescent Drive <clears throat> tax map parcels 222 hyphen 2 hyphen 2 through 15 the property is currently split zoned between B3 which is our general business district and R1A which is single-family residential the request is to rezone the entire property B3. Uh, the proposed use at this time is for mini self-storage. However, uh, the council do, does need to recognize that anything that's allowed in a B3 could ultimately go in those on that property if anything were to change. Uh, property owner is Fellock Properties, uh, here today represented by Sam Blaylock and Mike Felty. The Request was advertised and adjoining property owner notified according to city code. There have been no previous zoning map amendment requests for this property to the knowledge of staff. <clears throat> Existing land use, the property is currently temp uh, temporarily being used for storage for a BBU project, but it is vacant otherwise. As I mentioned before, it's split zone between R1A and B3. Future land use map designation is regional commercial. The size of the site is 14 parcels and approximately 4.65 acres. 
Uh, historically, it was used for construction offices. It's basically just trees and grass for the vegetation. The property has street frontage along Long Crescent Drive for approximately 700 feet, <clears throat> and vehicles will currently access the property at the western end. There is a driveway entrance there already. The existing uses bordering the subject tract are residential to the south, a church and an insurance agency to the southwest. Property immediately to the east is vacant, but it does become more commercial as it moves towards the intersection with Lee Highway. And of course, Interstate 81 is to the north. <clears throat> the oldest zoning map in our offices, likely from the 1970s, shows the subject property as, be as being split zone between R1A and B3. So it's most likely that it came into the city like this in the 1974-75 annexation. Uh, consistency with the 2017 adopted city comprehensive plan. The plan does not specifically address this area. Uh, the future land use map, as I mentioned, shows the subject property as regional commercial. Uses are commercial uh, that are large in scale draw from a regional consumer audience, so say a hotel, retail, or movie theaters, any type of commercial use. <clears throat> I just want to go through the staff comments that I received on the project. So as far as impacts, for local traffic, uh, Public Works had no comment on potential traffic in this area. Natural resources, there should be no adverse effects on natural resources. Staff will require all environmental related permitting to be obtained prior to development, including soil and erosion control and stormwater management. <clears throat> Public facilities, the school system, the proposed map amendment should not impact the local school system in any way, should also not have any impact on parks or recreation. Emergency services, uh, Mike Armstrong, the Bristol fire chief commented that it looks like there are two blue fire hydrants in close proximity to the property. The records show that the closest hydrant flows 1,577 1, gallons per minute. I do not have any issues or concerns. Eric Blevins, the fire marshal, commented there are three hydrants on Long Crescent covering the area from behind the Harbor Freight Shopping Center to a hydrant at the neighboring property of Kingsway Church. Hydrants and flow rates are acceptable for the change. Comments from BVU on utilities. Richard Atkins from BVU commented there are no electrical issues. Philip King, also from BVU, commented that the closest sewer service is on either Brookdale Circle, Circle or Lawndale Drive, which of course is to the south and east of the property. Uh, the developer would be responsible for any utility upgrades or extensions that could be needed to serve the development. Easements would be required if those extensions are on private property. Uh, and I have a map there that kind of showed those locations. Currently, though, there is septic installed for the property. And if it is determined that that is acceptable for the use, then that can be used. <clears throat> uh, the public transit does not serve this area. Mac Chapman, our economic development specialist, commented that I do not believe property values will negative be negatively impacted by a decision to rezone the property. And um, our GIS coordinator, Kelly Miller, commented that GIS had no issues with the rezoning request. So I just want to just move into the conclusion and recommendation. Split zone properties in the city of Bristol are unusual and are generally not considered good land use practice. Section 50-23 of the city code calls for all new zoning district boundaries to follow lot lines, stream beds, right-of-way lines, etc., so that the zoning of a specific lot is clear. The 2021 update of the zoning ordinance did correct many of the split zone lots that we had in the city. Unfortunately, the lots in questions for this request were left in their current form. If city staff had determined that there was more B3 area on these lots than there was R1A area, that the applicant could have requested relief from the Planning Commission under uh, 50-23, Section 5, where it says where district boundary lines as appearing on the zoning map divide a lot in single ownership, the requirements for the district in which the greater portion of the lot lies may be extended to the balance of the lot by the approval of the Planning Commission. 
Unfortunately for the applicant, staff determined that the makeup of the lots were approximately 52% R1A, 48% B3. So that is what triggered the rezoning request. <clears throat> Two commercial properties currently front on this section of Long Crescent Drive. Also, the former Shoney site, which is just up the street, has a driveway entrance at the eastern end. Screening would be required between the B3 and any other lots zoned for residential use if a use were to open there. Um, as mentioned earlier in the report, the future land use map and the comprehensive plan designates this area as commercial. Granting the request would correct an area which is currently split zone and expand the commercial potential of the property. At their December 20th meeting, the Planning Commission voted 6-0 to recommend the request to City Council for approval. Staff recommends that the City Council approve the request for a zoning map amendment on first ordinance reading. All right, thank you for that report. I'm looking for a motion and a second for first reading of the ordinance in full or by caption only. Move to approve first reading by caption only. Okay. Second. All right, we have a motion by Councilman Pollard and a second by Councilman Osborne. Um, clerk, or no, Council discussion. Sorry, got ahead of myself. You said that right now uh, the property is being used uh, large, uh, at least partly for storage for a BVU project. Is that use allowed in a B3 zone? Honestly, it is not. I did not even find out about that till the proposal came. Um, we have tried to contact BVU, haven't had much luck on determining when that, how long that's going to go, but um, we have a couple other areas in town that we're having that same issue, so we are working on that. Would that potentially fall under the um, fairly broad-ranging exception that government use is allowed in any zone? So I would have BVU would be allowed to use it, a private uh, developer wouldn't? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if that was it's something on the city attorney can I would have to look more into that but you know just with uh, I'll just look more into that but, but being as it was a temporary use but going forward it's not allowed to be used for uh, outdoor storage by right? the true nature of the zoning ordinance no it is not and we're also having that same issue with BVU and Spring Lake as well uh, they have parked their contractors have parked it's not BVU, it's contractors that have parked their equipment on a lot in Spring Lake, and uh, we've attempted to get some clarification from BVU as to how long that will take place, and we've yet to hear. And I believe some stuff has been staged on Old Abbott and Highway. Okay, I wasn't aware of yeah, that. Yeah, neither was I. But. So they've got a, a lot of pipes that are laid out in a lot of areas. So. Oh, I did see those the other day, down near the creek. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> From a, if it's a very short-term temporary use, and you know, we might be able to do something, but if it's going to be long-term, that's that's what we look at. That we don't want that going on, basically. Thank you. So I know you had mentioned um, you had reached out to adjoining property owners, which you know, there's a limited number of. Have you heard from anyone else in the general Long Crescent community? I have not. Um, you know, I did read the letter at the last meeting at the public hearing from the one property owner. Um, he has not contacted me again except to see if any, anybody else had had any objections or if anything was said at the public hearing. And I told him, no, it was not. Um, updated him on what the Planning Commission did, and I just got to thank you. Um, so I, but I have not heard directly from anyone else. If I remember correctly, his concern was about access to his own property, but that access road is on property that's not being rezoned, correct? Correct. It is that one small lot to the far east or to the far right of, you know, the black I've got outlined there. He does not own the property where that lot goes to behind, but there is property further to the west on Long Crescent where he can have access. So we're not cutting him off because he was basically already cut off in this location. His access would be further down Long Crescent. And the property in question for that's not part of this being rezoned? No, it is not. You know, I talked to Mr. 
Felty of, about the business model he's looking at putting on there. And I think it's a, a great idea what he has to put on there. So I'd like to see it move forward. Yeah, I was just no. going to chime in and say, I think when, when zoning stuff like this comes to us, we just, we have to remember just it's about the highest and best use of the particular property. And uh, while we don't have that much undeveloped land anymore in the city limits, you know, just my opinion, this stretch is, I don't foresee anyone coming in to build a, a big subdivision on this stretch just because of the proximity to the interstate. And mm -hmm. I, I don't foresee like a, like a hotel or a restaurant or a retail development coming on this stretch just because of the access. So it, it to me, it, it seems like the, the business model that they're going to be doing and this project they're going to be doing, it, it makes sense for, for the property. Um, so yeah, I've got no issues with it while they would be allowed potentially to do anything allowed in the B3 zone, the access is going to restrict them significantly mm -hmm. to things along these lines. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. not, that, not that the access is bad. I think the access will be great, good enough for, for their business, but maybe it, it wouldn't be adequate for, for some like large hotel or restaurant or something like that. All right, we'll move into uh, clerk. Please call the roll. Farnham? Yes. Holmes? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Pollard? Yes. Nay? Yes. All right, uh, reading of the ordinance by caption only. Ordinance number 24-1, an ordinance by the City Council of Bristol, Virginia, approving the request to amend the city zoning map from single-family residential R-1A to general business district B-3 for 1875 Long Crescent Drive, tax map parcels 222-2-2 through 222-2-15. All right, next item, uh, ma matters to be presented by members of the public, non-agenda items, and we have one person signed up for public comment, and that is Chris Nupp. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, first thing I want to do is congratulate <coughs> Becky and Jake on your new positions. Neil, you've done a good job. Michael, Anthony, you guys do a good job, too. Uh, I just want to thank everybody that's had a hand in getting this extra funding coming in. Uh, I know it's a lot of hard work, a lot of fussing, feuding, but you get the right people in place. Hey, it goes a long ways. And just as far as my opinion, we've had extra people in it. Starting out with you guys, the Congress, the Senator, the Governor, maybe a couple other people going up the ladder. Want to thank everybody. This opens the doors up, maybe for future money, if this all comes in like it's supposed to. So maybe it opened the doors up for future money because God only knows anything can happen with this nightmare. We've already found that out, haven't we, Randy? <laughs> But uh, just keep continuing. You guys have done great. I know I've been up here. I've given you guys a hard time. But I thank you, too, when you need it. But it takes all of us to make things happen. And like I said, it's amazing what we can do when we have the right people in place. So continue doing a good job. And I wanted to recognize the law enforcement we thank you. My son actually joined the police department here in Bristol, Virginia. And it's not what a mother and father want to hear, but to have the policeman out there like that, that's a dangerous job. It's not like it was back in the 70s and 80s when I was a teenager. We've done a lot of partying and stuff, but mostly hot rodding and stuff like that. I've been taking home a couple nights. I'd rather been put in jail. <laughs> it didn't work that way. But congratulations, Becky, Jake, you. if you can hear me. Thank you guys again. 
Everybody have a good night. Thank you. All right. Next is closed session pursuant of section 2.2-3711.A1. Uh, Code of Virginia 1950 as amended. Discussion, consideration of or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, or resignation of specific public officers, appointees, or employees of the public body, councilmanic appointments. So I'm looking for a motion and a second to go into closed session. Uh, I move that we enter into closed session for the reasons stated. Second. All right, a motion by Councilman Osborne and a second by Councilman Farnham. Uh, clerk, please call the roll. Farnham? Yes. Holmes? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Pollard? Yes. Nay? Yes. By roll call vote, council members certify that only business matters lawfully exempted from the open meeting requirements as specified in the motion to convene an executive session were discussed. Clerk, please call the roll. Farnham? Yes. Holmes? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Pollard? Yes. Nate? Yes. Uh, council, uh, here is the new list of appointments for the upcoming year. Chamber of Commerce, Becky Nave. Finance Committee, Becky Nave. Planning Commission, Anthony Farnham. BVU, Anthony Farnham. Finance Committee, Jake Holmes. District 3 Government Co-op, Neil Osborne. Believe in Bristol, Neil Osborne. Rhythm and Roots, Anthony Farnham. New River Mount Rogers Workforce Investment Area Consortium, Neil Osborne. Birthplace of Country Music, Becky Nave. Highlands Community Services, Jake Holmes. Redevelopment and Housing Authority, Jake Holmes. People Incorporated, Jake Holmes. Mount Rogers Planning District, Michael Pollard. Train Station Foundation, Michael Pollard. Board of Social Services, Becky Nave. New Rivers, Mount Rogers PDC, Michael Pollard. Appalachian Juvenile Commission, Neil Osborne. Highlands Community Policy and Management, Anthony Farnham. Bristol Public Library, Michael Pollard. Transportation Safety Commission, Anthony Farnham. The Bristol, Tennessee, Virginia Metropolitan Planning Organization, Neil Osborne. Explore Bristol, Jake Holmes. And the Regional Jail Authority, Becky Nave. All right. All right, we're looking for a motion to approve these councilmanic appointments. Uh, I move that we approve the councilmanic appointments as presented. Second. All right, we have a motion by Councilman Osborne and a second by Councilman Farnham. Clerk, please call the roll. Farnham? Yes. Holmes? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Pollard? Yes. Nay? Yes. Next, uh, the consent agenda, approval of the minutes of December 12th, 2023, and the budget transfer for general fund. Uh, I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. All right, we have a motion by Councilman Osborne and a second by Councilman Farnham. Kirk, clerk, please call the roll. Farnham? Yes. Holmes? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Pollard? Yes. Nave? Yes, we stand adjourned.